Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome from uh, myself, the colleagues here, and the team of the United Nations in Tehran. Um, <clears throat> we obviously had a lot more people here in the morning uh, and yesterday, and I wanted to say, as I walked around and looked around, how happy I was to see how, how many people had actually come to an engagement of this sort where we're talking about partnering and a future for, uh, for business and for other forms of interaction within, within Iran. Um, there are many of us who work uh, on the ground day in and day out to try to make a change. And uh, for those of you who wish to add your shoulders to that particular effort, we are very, very grateful. My uh, interaction this afternoon with you will, will be slightly different from what you have uh, been accustomed to in, in the last day and a half. I'm going to talk uh, largely about corporate social responsibility. And uh, I've got a few images to share with you, a few slides that won't have any text. It's all uh, essentially uh, images from Iran about the extent and nature and pattern of the problem that we face. But essentially, when I was listening to the, the talk that was happening for the last day and a half, we heard a lot about wealth the creation of wealth, the opportunity, the technical uh, progress that will allow us to get more uh, wealth. In fact, one could almost get the sense that um, we are talking about the Middle East's last untapped market. And that's all necessary and important. In order for wealth to trickle down and to be broadly based in society, it has to be created. And that's where you guys come in. <clears throat> but there are other dimensions to acting responsibly, as a corporate citizen in this modern day and age. Uh, there is a, a broader obligation, shall we say, to minimize the inequality that we see and to take care of the only planet that we have that allows us to live uh, wealthily and in a civilized manner. And so for those reasons, I believe it is no longer possible to focus exclusively on profit. It is important that when we have growth, that it be inclusive. It is important that when we have development, it be sustainable. And it is important that when we talk about our environment, that we lay the foundation for safeguarding it. Now, that requires partnerships. It requires government, civil society, and the private sector to get together and form partnerships. And when we talk with our partners in uh, the, the private sector, we talk about this issue. Corporate Social Responsibility, or CSR, as you've, as you've, you've heard it talked about. <clears throat> to be quite blunt, I think that the essence of corporate social responsibility is not about charity, it's not about goodwill. It's not a luxury item for large corporations. It makes good business sense if it's considered as a strategic tool, one that influences decisions, influences operations, and most importantly, in this day and age of globalized information and profiling, influences our reputations. Now, <clears throat> back in the year 2000, the United Nations uh, worked with a number of uh, private sector organizations to come up with what was called the, and still is called, the Global Compact. That is a, a, a body of norms that involves thousands of companies, it focuses on four things. The first is human rights. For example, is the gender parity in the, in, the, uh, in the business environment. I received a tweet from someone last night, in fact, talking about this very event, saying, is anyone advocating for gender parity in the workplace? Second issue is, um, is basically labor and opportunities for free association formation of unions. The third issue of the global uh, compact is where we focus on anti-corruption, as one needs to focus on in, in all countries uh, of the planet. The fourth area is environment. Now, for the past day and a half, I've heard talk about the first three in different forums, this plenary and some of the breakouts, but we haven't really talked about environment. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that and why you, as good corporate citizens, need to take care when you're investing in Iran uh, to focus on aspects where our natural capital is being diminished dramatically. I, my reason for being here is that I work with the United Nations, representing 400 uh, colleagues on the ground, 90% of whom are Iranian. And uh, we focus our work with Iran 
on four areas, five in fact. One is, um, one is refugees, one is narcotics, one is health, the fourth is building a resilient economy, and the last one is environment. But the last is first, in a sense. Our focus on the environment is the top priority that we have right now because working on the environment, we're looking at sustainability. We're looking at ensuring uh, sustainability for the future. In terms of the challenges that we face, um, I, I number six. First, climate change. Most of what you see, numbers two to six, are problems that we face in Iran largely as a result of man-made decisions over the last several decades. And we have compromised our ability to um, sustainably work in the future and live comfortably because of that. But the, the very first one I start with is climate change because if you look at the numbers, what we are facing in the Middle East as a whole is a hotter, drier future. Hotter, drier. I've looked at the numbers, and frankly, they're terrifying. 2.5 degrees Celsius in the next 20 to 30 years, minimum. Speculative, but reasonable. That's before you consider the, kick, the feedbacks that will kick in uh, if other aspects of our ecosystem across the planet um, uh, accelerate uh, uns uh, unsustainably. So we have climate change. We have energy. Um, there are others on the podium more qualified than I to talk about energy, but we are looking essentially at a situation where Iran is currently the ninth largest greenhouse gas emitter on the planet. And in its quite understandable desire to re-embrace the global economy, we will uh, see a, a ratcheting up of uh, the focus on fossil fuels with an infrastructure that has been hit by sanctions and many other uh, dimensions in the last several years and is, and is now old. That infrastructure will leak, and it will create um, additional pressure on greenhouse gases across the planet. Land degradation in an arid and semi-arid country already, with uh, a massive population, increasing population, uh, the search for fuel um, in the rangelands by people ruminants, it's a lot of problems. And we see uh, forest uh, deforestation and, and uh, land degradation as a part of, of that. Air pollution, uh, my colleague from this, uh, the Swedish ambassador yesterday talked about the extent to which between November and uh, March in Tehran alone, we deal with massive uh, problems of, of air quality. But we also have huge problems with dust and sandstorms coming across, largely from Iraq and from Syria, um, in, in, in dust bowls over there uh, as a result of uh, a number of problems, and uh, they dump massive quantities of sand, destroying agriculture, destroying uh, people's uh, lungs, um, in, in, infiltrating into uh, uh, computers and, and other forms of, of industry, and so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem. Biodiversity loss, as a result of all of that, there was once a time when Iran was famed for its biodiversity, no more, and no longer. I would like to focus on water. These, uh, apologies to colleagues at the back who may not be able to see, but the, the lines are pretty straightforward. This line talks about an annual per capita renewable water. You can see over the past century, it has gone down dramatically. The population has risen at the same time. We are now here, about here, and we are at 1,000 cubic meters per person per year, which is essentially the, the, the stage at which a, any country on the planet will un, uh, undergo water stress. We should be worried. I'll focus on two areas, Lake Urumie and Hamoun, so that you guys can get a sense of what is actually happening on the ground. First, Lake Urumie, that's what it used to look like 20 years ago. These are satellite pictures spanning from 1998 to a couple of years ago. The black represents the water. That's what we got now. It's a little bit better now because of meltwater that's just entered, but it is still a big problem. And that's what I took photographs of when I was last there. It's like the Martian landscape. Salt is blowing everywhere into people's faces. Into, it dumps its way onto the uh, agriculture and surrounding areas. Hamoun's next, between Afghanistan and, uh, uh, and Iran. Again, satellite pictures, 500 kilometers above the surface of the planet. Iran, Afghanistan, the, the blue represents the water. That's what it looks like um, uh, a couple of years ago, and it's actually worse now. And these uh, are pictures from eye level. That's what it was like 20 years ago. And these pictures I took um, not too long ago. 
stretches of dust and sand, and people's livelihoods destroyed, and people's homes buried in sand. So, um, colleagues and I are more than happy to talk about some of the solutions to these problems. And uh, I return to the fact that we have, uh, we have elements in place. We have technology that can help us. We have um, best practice that the UN tries to uh, promote. We have, um, and I'd be happy to talk about my perspectives on this too, a government um, uh, that at the leadership level understands this issue and I believe is embracing it as a, as a, as a challenge. Um, we have political problems. We have the need for uh, governments to look long-term at what the solutions can be. We also have a, a need for those in the international environment to cut us a little bit of slack. Um, the Global Environment Facility, for example, uh, is something that ought to enable Iran to draw down uh, $20 uh, million over a five-year period, but that's been blocked for geopolitical reasons. So the kind of work that we could do on the ground is, is not um, making the kind of progress that we'd like to. Public awareness, money, and norms, things that ought to uh, occupy your minds. And I return to close out with the, the, the view that um, corporate social responsibility is something that you should use as a tr strategic management tool for information, for decisions, but for your reputation as well. This planet will only be saved if we partner government, civil society, others, and the private sector. It's up to us. It's up to you. Thank you. Gary, thank, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Rather alarming, I must say, uh, but should concentrate all our minds. Christoph, what are your views on, on this environmental challenge? Um, yeah, I mean, the, uh, Gary elaborated very much on the situation, which is really very, very dramatic um, on the ground. Uh, and there isn't too much to add uh, on the air pollution and, and as well the fact that climate change hits the uh, Iran very badly. Um, which, by the way, cost, uh, if I read correctly, about 1% of the GDP, so about 3.7 billion per year. So it is definitely a big topic. Um, and I want to add as well, in terms of setting the, the stage, the situation, um, the unemployment rate in the country is pretty high, which is not directly connected to climate change, but which could be potentially an opportunity um, reducing it when fighting climate change. And then um, I would like to, um, to come to the, to the challenges, basically. Um, the, the challenges um, that I see is that Iran wants to develop in a resilient uh, way. It wants to develop a resilient economy. At the same time, the whole growth is very much dependent on oil and gas and energy intensive industries. Um, and at the same time, Iran wants to reduce emissions by 4% uh, in 2030 compared to business as usual at least, and maybe up to 12% if it gets a, appropriate uh, financing and so on. Um, and so then the question is, how can this all fit together? Does it match? Um, and um, as I say, what, what Iran hopes to get is um, some support on, on the financing side, as well as tra technology transfer and, and capacity building. And of course, you can see it all as a big threat and, and a difficult thing, but you can see it as well as an opportunity because all these measures that have to be taken can create a lot of jobs and it can save a lot of cost and, and make the country resilient for the future, all the measures on the energy efficiency side, um, on the gas leakage, on the flaring and so on. Um, and as well, uh, as we learned yesterday, the Iran wants to build six gigawatts of additional electricity power every year. Um, so. Um, if it can be built in a renewable way, or at least part of it, of course, it would be a big gain. And in order for all of this to happen, it needs, it needs of course, um, the right uh, systems behind the right um, frameworks on, on, the, on the political side. And one of it is, of course, getting rid, to a certain extent, from the, or to, to a bigger extent even, of the subsidies. This can be uh, one part of the, of the bigger framework and instead installing direct uh, support for, for the poor people. Um, but interesting things uh, we see as well in other countries, like in, in Indonesia or in, in India, we see now that feed and tariffs have recently been installed in, or denominated in US dollar. Um, so basically, I know that we are in Iran we are not yet at this level, but when you think about how to attract foreign investors in the country, which is another goal, and how to de-risk their investments, another thing can be as well to think about feed and tariffs, in fact, in US dollar. 
Um, and then I want to throw two last things into the, into the debate. Uh, one is the Iran could think as well about participating on all or, or more on these uh, regional and city level initiatives, uh, which we see uh, a few around the globe. Um, one is uh, called R20, which was initiated by uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, where kind of 20 regions around the world came together. Another one like C40, and uh, this ICLE local network where thousands of communities and so came together. And the idea of these networks is always to, to help cities um, on a city-by-city -city level, basically see well, how, can, and how can you uh, become more efficient, how can you reduce cost, how, you, how can you potentially be finance things in a better way, because if a single city wants to refurbish its light, it's, it's too small, but if several communities come together, then it's an attractive investment target for an investor, and so on. Um, so basically, this Iran, there, I think there would be an opportunity to participate in these city and uh, co local community yeah. collaboration networks. And the last thing um, is, um, comes to my mind is like getting ready for results-based finance, which I think is another key word. Um, Iran wants to get a lot of money into the country from the outside, and um, the Green Climate Fund might eventually provide 100 million US dollar from 2020 onwards for exactly these things in developing countries. Now the question is, how would it be channeled, this money? And um, we would think that quite a lot of this money wouldn't be just poured into developing countries, but distributed on a results-based level. So a country promises to do something, but only if the effect is measured, you measure that you actually did achieve already a certain emission reduction. You, um, you measure that a certain health benefit has been achieved, employment has been created, you get the money every year in hindsight. So this results-based finance. And I think there is an opportunity of getting ready for this to set up the right, uh, right schemes. Yeah, Hamad, you've done a lot of work in Iran on green technology. Uh, what are you, I mean, looking at the photographs that Gary showed, I mean, terribly kind of gloom making. I mean, is there a green answer? Um, let me first appreciate your talk, Gary's talk. It's very important to protect environment, but I, I think it's fair to think about the past and consider that how this problem, how the earth has faced this problem because of the history of using a huge amount of hydrocarbons yeah. in the past by industrial countries first. Uh, and these days it's going on and is continued, continually happening by uh, large countries, blooming countries, Greek countries, uh, on the top of them China with a lot of consumption of coal. So the global warming and climate change is not uh, a, a local problem. We should think of that problem globally. But again, locally, yes. We, locally, we, we have to uh, think of some, prob some solutions to uh, the problem in, inside the country. But uh, my specialty is not water and other fields of environment. Um, my focus is on energy, as you mentioned. Uh, but let me um, logically and hier hierarchically break down the, the problem and uh, mention some solutions that may uh, be relevant to this audience that can help to solve the problem. Uh, local thinking, uh, I think the first step or the most important step should be taken by the government and policymakers and parliament uh, regarding the energy prices. We, we need real prices for energies, electricity, oil and gas, all of them. Uh, fortunately, I, I think some promising events are going to happen in the future. Uh, the last one that I heard just a few days ago was about liberalization of uh, gasoline stations to make brands, new brands locally or uh, um, some partners from outside of the country can share, have shares to make new brands uh, by owning 
60, I think, gas and pumps, gasoline pumps. This is a step towards privatization and yeah. liberalization of the prices. You know that, for example, for bread it has happened inside the mega cities. You, you can find many different prices from the south of the city to north of the city, yeah. um, sometimes twice. This can happen for gasoline, but it takes time. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a, a solution, a, a fundamental solution that to have real prices. Uh, but but uh, that's always politically very difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. Every but country in the world. Th th this event that uh, and news on news, I, you can find it on site yes. that uh, Mr. the Minister of Oil has announced that this. Uh, possibility of uh, making new brands to own uh, gasoline stations. Do you think there should be a carbon tax as well? Mm, not or yet, but in future, yes, maybe, mm. yeah. Gary, your presentation, um, it's pretty alarming. Um, is there any room for optimism in the Gary Lewis view of, of Iran and the world in terms of climate change and CSR and so on or not? Yes, I am found fundamentally an optimist. Um, I guess uh, 30 years in the UN have seen some pretty horrific things in different parts of the world. Uh, I think that um, <clears throat> there are solutions, absolutely there are solutions. Um, the question is whether, given the, the intensity of the feedback systems that I've talked about, I hinted at in the, in the speech, that we are uh, in time. And we, we've just had, uh, we just had our Paris Agreement, and we're talking about keeping, uh, keeping uh, t t global temperature increases to uh, under 2 degrees Celsius, ideally 1.5. The question is, uh, will the feedbacks kick in in such a way that we, we, we go beyond that? But I in terms what, of the... What are the mitigation commitments that Iran has made? Iran has made uh, a commitment to keep, uh, to, to reduce by 4% over the next few years its uh, GHG uh, emissions. But the real issue uh, for me is, given the, the list of things, I mean, the, it's critical to, to address two of them. Um, the first is the issue of energy mm -hmm. and how to um, modify the energy portfolio so that we get more renewables, more solar, uh, more geothermal, more wind. Um, and the issue of water, how do we manage that? I, what I didn't say, which is even more potentially alarming, uh, not just for Iran, but the entire Middle East, is when you have um, water uh, stress moving to water scarcity, and I mean, those last few pictures from the Hamoons, yeah. um, uh, you know, the, the, the people that are there, the 500,000 people in those areas, when there's no water, they will have to move. Yeah. And when they move, they will come crashing into the lives of other people within Iran. Um, who are also searching for jobs and so forth. And this is a sort of problem that uh, overuse, over drilling of water. The, the problem, in, in fact, in the Hamoons is not really Iran's uh, complication. It, it comes from the, uh, the diversion of, of, of the river Helmand in Afghanistan into Iran. But there are uh, self-made problems that we're dealing with within Iran. And so the issue then becomes on water, do we price it right? Are we using it efficiently for our agriculture, which takes up 90% of, of water use? Um, are we educating our kids on how to use and manage water? Are we um, essentially dealing with um, uh, enforcement of the laws and policies that are in place? If people are taking water illegally, what are the options? So there are a, bun a bundle of things that can be done to address the water issue, the energy issue, the biodiversity issue, and a lot of that work is being done um, uh, by the United Nations in collaboration with uh, national and provincial governments and the communities. Yeah. Let me, we've got five minutes left, so let me take some questions from the audience. A question here, and a microphone I think will be wending its way with alacrity towards you. Microphone someone. Yeah, just talk loudly. Gary, if I may, um, I've got two very, very quick questions. Um, the UN sanctions against Iran. Uh, congratulations to the US for making Iran a much more polluted place. What is the UN doing in relation to reversing the effect of sanctions? And a quote that famous poet sadly said, that if you hurt one human, you hurt all. And you can't call yourself human if you're willing to hurt each other. This is something perhaps our friends would want to remember those who would see the Iran deal reversed. The world will be a more polluted place. So what do we say to our grandkids? The second one is corruption within environmentalism. 
And this is a big issue for all of us in the West in particular. And we saw with Volkswagen and a few other car manufacturers that they actually um, tainted the results of their cars, presenting them as much more environmentally friendly than they appear to be. This is something that Iran Khodro, the car manufacturer in Iran, doesn't participate in. What is the UN doing in this regard, in terms of punishing companies in much more severe ways on stopping environmental corruption, if I can call it that? Uh, Gary, you're in the hot seat there. You know? Apparently, the UN rules. Knew that going into this meeting. Thank you very much, sir, for your questions. Um, the second one first. Look, the, the, I'm not sure that the UN uh, can do more than try to set international uh, norms. It can uh, accumulate knowledge. It can provide technical expertise. It can promote regional cooperation. And it can do what I'm trying to do now, which is to advocate for a number of causes. Now, uh, with regard to anti-corruption, um, which I indicated in my statement, is something that uh, besets every country, uh, of course, to differing degrees. Um, we have in place a UN uh, corruption against, uh, Convention Against Corruption, and there are a number of technical uh, bodies of work that um, we recommend, including anti-corruption agencies and so forth, in, in every country. But I, I have to uh, state the obvious, and that is that the United Nations uh, does not hold sovereign sway in any country. And we have to remember that Iran is a respected founder member of the United Nations. And therefore, uh, in the context of, of working on things like uh, con contentious and controversial things like anti-corruption, um, we work uh, closely with our partners in the various ministries to try to promote uh, those goals and hold people who are um, uh, contemptibly abusing their office uh, accountable. On your first point, um, which was the, uh, the you, you referred to Saudi and you referred to holding uh, 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 individuals account for the, the, the consequences of sanctions. Um, the multilateral sanctions, which were uh, voted on by uh, the Security Council, and which um, uh, then were kicked in and, and caused some distress, some significant distress, the, the tail end of which I was uh, sadly uh, there to see three years ago when I started working. These things um, have had an impact. Uh, there have been, in most cases, the multilateral sanctions have been lifted now, and we move on. Looking back with a sense of optimism is not something that I think we ought to be looking at. And therefore, uh, the, the level and technical and breadth and nature of the things that the United Nations in Iran, the 400 of us that I mentioned, um, are trying to do is, is, is what, we, what we focus on for the future. I can't, we have a German here, though you may be resident in Switzerland now, so I can't resist, Christoph, asking you to uh, deal with the second question, which was about the cheating by, I think, a certain German company originally. Uh, Japanese companies have followed suit, but uh, what do you think? Um, I mean, we see this topic of corruption as a very important one in the climate arena. And um, now, as there is going to be this big pot of money available, eventually this 100 billion from 2020 per annum, the question is still unclear. It's still up, up to decide how the money will be distributed. And, and on a government level, all the developing countries, they, uh, quite many of them try to lobby for government to government level. Basically, the money would flow in on the government level and then eventually be distributed. And then we see this already in some countries happening. Now, uh, the first signs of it, this would be open for corruption on every level. Um, while we had a system in the past which doesn't work very, very much in the moment, like this clean development mechanism, where the money is really given on a results-based level, as I said before, to the project on the ground. So it goes down all the... All, and, and actually, it has been disputed very much as well by, by governments because, because they don't get their fingers on the money. The money goes all the way down to the project. And so I very much hope that we can get back to a system, or to a certain extent to a system, which is really results-based and the money goes to the very... Um, down, down to the project level, as opposed to getting down government channels uh, via corruption one way to the next. No. Yes, a question here and then a question there. Yes. And the microphone is coming, I think. There should be, yes, the young lady with the microphone is coming across now. Or not. Is when there a race between these young ladies? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, how receptive would the Iranian government and industry be to, say, a Western solar company uh, that actively wants to assist in the process of, uh, you know, mitigating uh, 
آلودگی هوا in Tehran and just generally getting Iran on the renewables bandwagon with what sort of assistance would be provided to you know because I know like past solar efforts have kind of been scrapped because pe either people hadn't gotten it or there wasn't demand or there wasn't really an education process okay. but aside from subsidies and these other things how much would there be an assistance from the government on down to get people on the renewable bandwagon over there. Hamid, can you answer that about renewables, welcome for renewables? Yeah, actually, the, the second part of uh, the solution that I think can help reduction of pollutions and uh, that goes back to two sides of demand and supply. Uh, on the demand side, for example, for transportation, uh, Companies can invest on some projects that can reduce the demand for transportation, uh, which I didn't find during these days that is mentioned by uh, audience and speakers, uh, which is very potential inside the country to be invested on. Uh, regard concerning the uh, telecommunication industries and ICT. Uh, this industry, these industries can help reduction of transportation demand, uh, e-commerce, e-governance, sure. and e-learning, so on. Uh, the other thing that can be invested on is uh, public transportation. But, for example, construction of more roads, I think it's not helpful. Uh, because it increase, uh, causes increase in, in, in attractiveness if you, of drivers. If you build drivers. the road, the cars will come. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's stop with that. Uh, a final question, a final two questions. Let's take them together. Because let me mention the, yeah. other point, uh, yeah, uh, sure. the other point. Yeah, sure. The other point. The supply side for yeah. renewables. There are uh, incentives to, to promote investment on renewables in Iran and uh, good fit, fit in tariffs are suggested from the government side, and especially there is compensation for exchange rate and inflation oh, rate. Feed-in tariffs, I think, are a very good idea, but I seem to remember that they've got the British government into trouble now because they've suddenly This is the first step. After, after a while, it, it should change to auction. Exactly. Uh, two questions there. Uh, these two gentlemen here, uh, young lady with the microphone, please, the just here. Oh, you got one, great, thank you. Hi, so um, some of the problems you've mentioned, like pollution and uh, water, they've been talk you know, uh, we've been talking about this for a couple of years, especially for pollution. I remember when, since I was, uh, you know, going to high school in Tehran, that was a problem. So, and I think the problem is uh, these, um, the, the, the solution come from a long-term and a fairly complex planning, which um, the government in Iran, um, I think probably, uh, doesn't have, uh, is not capable of, sort of adhering to. So what sort of, do you see the government of Iran now sort of trying to um, come up with a, with a um, longer term plan to uh, deal with these problems and what sort of uh, help UN can provide for Thank that? You. Thank you. Thank Let's you. hold that question. And there's a gentleman next, yeah. I think, um, I think the question is directed more towards Gary Lewis. Um, as, as, as someone who represents the United Nations, I think a key theme of the past two days has been finance, how to get things into Iran to enable projects to be serviced and implemented. Are the UN prepared in any way to, to help in this regard for companies, European, American, so on and so forth, who would be willing to assist in sustainability projects in Iran, to assist in corporate social responsibility, renewable energy products? Are the UN willing to be the introducers or the facilitators of these companies who are desperate to bring their expertise into Iran but can't simply because of financial um, difficulties. Gary, I think you're, again, really in the hot seat and you can, you can take both those questions. It's very kind of you. The Tehran Thank government you. and the UN. There you go. Okay, uh, national government, um, speaking quite frankly, my, my sense is that uh, President Rouhani certainly understands the issue. He's spoken about this openly. He's even talked about water being a major uh, uh, security issue in the region. He made comparisons to the RLC. We have a vice president for the environment, Madame Ebtekar, 
who is um, a champion in her own right uh, on these issues. We have Energy Minister Chichian, we have the Rahbar, the Supreme Leader, also coming out and talking about the importance of um, environment as, a, as, an, as an issue that affects the future um, development and human security uh, of, of Iran. That is not something that one sees commonplace across the planet and certainly not across the Middle East. The objective, therefore, should be to take those, uh, those policy visions um, and work them through the system because most of the complications that we face comes from lower down, to be honest, in my assessment. Um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the bureaucratic machinery has not quite um, felt uh, the, the need to engage to the degree that it ought to. Citizens, you and me, have not done the same. I mean, one sees in, 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 um, in Iran, in Tehran, uh, where uh, my wife and I are privileged to call home now, um, people washing down their front uh, steps with water and you go uh, 63 kilometers to the northwest and you see the Karaj Dam down 15, 20 meters and nobody's making the connection. This type of behavior is unsustainable. Therefore, um, in terms of leadership, yes. In terms of other aspects of society, no. There's a lot of catch up required. In terms, sir, of your question, second question on, on, um, on finance, we already are trying to do this, but the, the architecture of uh, the financial uh, arrangements that would allow for a greater degree of engagement is not up to the United Nations. I mean, our, our programs are relatively small. Um, but what we can do is fly the flag. What we can do is advocate, like what, as I said, I'm trying to do now. Um, and, and for those colleagues who are interested, by the way, uh, I've not detained you with a, a long and tedious description of what the UN is doing, but I have uh, put at the back of the hall there uh, some uh, environmentally friendly uh, uh, caches with a stick drive in it which contains most of the information you need to know about what the UN is doing and how you can contact uh, us and me if you need uh, to find out the answer to your question, sir. Thank you. Excellent. I think because we are six minutes and 14 seconds over, I'm going to thank you all very, very much, Christoph, Hamad, and Gary. Um, thank you very much, all of you. <laughs> and uh, let's hope that the planet survives for our grandchildren and so on.